that's the history of the earth. There's incredible competition for uh, harvesting light and producing food and then growth. So it's something where we do see a lot of evolutionary pressure. Now, photosynthesis, and for this audience, this is probably uh, a rather rudimentary diagram. But I want to focus your attention just on this little orange arrow. That how the energy moves from where it's collected in an antenna to the reaction center. And that's the only piece of photosynthesis that I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to leave all of the very interesting downstream biochemistry and storage aspects of this out of the talk. I'm only going to talk about motion of energy through the antenna and what the dynamics of that motion actually are. And that's the question that I want to ask. Not where does it go, but why and how. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of the talk today. Uh, the bug that we are going to use is chlorobium tepidum. It, it uh, is not uh, the fanciest photosynthetic uh, bacterium out there, but it is one of the oldest as a green sulfur bacteria. It's now relegated to some rather uh, unfavorable environments and warm springs. You find related green sulfur bacteria growing uh, very deep in the oceans. They have incredible efficiency at light harvesting. If they absorb a photon, they use it and they can live very deep in the Black Sea where each reactant center is getting one photon every 30 minutes or so. It's very interesting to see how efficient they are. They never drop their photon to a very good approximation. And that's something that attracted my attention as a chemist because it's a very disordered, soft system, and yet the quantum efficiency can be extremely high. And this is true for many photosynthetic complexes. I was talking to some of you earlier about uh, phycobilisomes, uh, and we see similar reported efficiencies there. It's, it's not something that's unique here, but it is something that we can study in this particular organism. So here's a uh, micrograph of what the chlorobium tepidum looks like. It's a prokaryotic cell, but you notice these white bodies around the outside. That's somewhat unusual in a prokaryotic cell. And that's, in fact, the major light harvesting antenna. It's a chlorosome. It's a chlorophyll-containing body. It contains solid rods of bacteria chlorophyll C, uh, as well as some carotenoids interspersed. The structure for this is recently solved within the last year. And it's a very interesting strategy. You have approximately 250,000 chlorophylls in these large rods. That's where the most of the light harvesting will take place. But then the energy, the excitons, the excited states created by that absorption process, those move from these uh, aggregates down through the phenyl matthews olsen complex, which is the protein that I'm going to talk about today, to the reaction center. So this little FMO complex works like an excitonic wire. It takes the excitations that are absorbed by others and transports them from the antenna to the reaction center. Uh, so that's the one that I want to look at. It, it Obviously, the efficiency through this has to be uh, at least as high or higher than the overall efficiency. So we know that its quantum efficiency is also extraordinary because we can measure the entire process. Now, the structure for this has been solved. It was the first chlorophyll-containing protein structure to be solved. Uh, in 1978, it's been revised a number of times. The crystal structures are absolutely incredible. Uh, you can see in the inner paragraph the difference between a carbon and a nitrogen. It's gorgeous. The quality of the crystals is fantastic. Uh, now, the problem, however, is that this beautiful crystal structure, what you see in gray and what catches your eye there is the protein. And the protein is what's evolved, and it, in fact, is the source of many of the dynamics. That we want to ask questions about what does the protein do? How do you engineer an environment around the chlorophylls? But as a laser spectroscopist, I have an inherent handicap. When I look at this protein, it looks to me uh, more like this. I can see the chlorophylls, but I can't see the protein. So I have an 800 nanometer laser pulse. I can see the absorption of the chlorophylls. I can't see the protein, but I want to ask questions about the protein. I want to ask questions about the dynamics. So this is the first piece of the puzzle. How are we going to understand what the protein is doing and how it's interacting with these chlorophylls to steer the dynamics when we can't see it. Um, but at the same time, even just from this very simple picture, we can also begin to discern some rather interesting design principles. That over and over again, nature uses this bacteria chlorophyll <laughs> molecule you know, in many different roles to do many different jobs. Now, this is not the approach that a chemist would take, and I'm trained as a chemist. I would I would take a different approach. If you come to me and you say, I want a molecule to absorb light at 800 nanometers, or I want a molecule that will give me a stable charge-separated state, I want a very strong reductant, I want a very strong oxidant, I wouldn't give you the same molecule. That, that would be bad business. I need to make a new molecule for every single job. That's what keeps me employed, right? As a chemist, we make a new molecule for every single purpose. Uh, and it's fun and it's a challenge. Nature's done something different. This is an engineering approach. This is using the same modular piece over and over again 
in a variety of different roles by controlling the environment around it. Now, unfortunately, that gets us back to the environment around it, which is the protein. The other aspect of this is the coupling. You couple these chlorophylls together in many different geometries, and you will get different types of splittings. And this will allow you to absorb a fairly broad range of colors of light. It will also allow you to create uphill or downhill pathways so the energy can flow. So there's also an aspect of this as coupling. So we really now have two questions, measuring coupling and measuring the environment. So those are the two pieces that we want to use to go forward. And then when I look at these, if I just look at the chlorine ring, this part up here, which is where the transition dipole is, I can get rid of the final chains. You can see clearly that there's seven strongly coupled tier chlorophylls. Now, those of you uh, who are working with Bob uh, and you have found the eighth chlorophyll, there is an eighth one in this complex. Um, we are searching desperately to find a spectroscopic signature of it. I haven't found, I haven't found it yet. Uh, we thought we did. We were wrong. Um, we're, try, we're trying hard to see that. I'd certainly love any ideas people have. But there's seven that are strongly coupled to one another that appear in our dynamics. So I'm going to take the slightly out-of-date view of seven strongly coupled bacterial chlorophylls in this complex, recognizing that there is an eight, but I can't see it, and I don't include it in my model because I have nothing to say about it. Uh, but if you have advice, we're looking for it. Um, so what do I do? I do the same thing any physicist would do. If I have a 7x7 seven seven Hamiltonian, where I have different site energies and they're all coupled to one another, I diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And in so doing, what I see are my slightly delocalized states, where they delocalize over, in some cases, two bacterial chlorophylls. In some cases, they don't delocalize much at all, and it's mostly on just one bacterial chlorophyll. But I can also get the energy levels. I can see that the high energy uh, peaks are arrayed on this side of the complex, the low energy on that side. So I'd expect the antenna to be up here, the reaction center to be down there. This has recently been confirmed. Uh, by the Gross and Blankenship Labs, that this, in fact, is the geometry in which it sits, which uh, makes a lot of sense from this picture. Uh, but it's nice to it's nice to know that that that, that works. Uh, and we want to watch how the energy moves through this complex. There are two pathways published by Brixner and Fleming in 2004, uh, and you see the white pathway where the energy moves this way, and the brown where it moves that way. The fact that the two pathways is something that's interesting that we'll come back to later. That we see these two separate paths, and you can imagine interferences between them and so on. But we know where the energy goes. We want to ask why and how. That's going to be the next step. So we need to see energy transfer on the time scale of 100 femtoseconds to a picosecond. That's approximately the relevant time scale for much of this energetic motion. And we want to be able to understand where we put the energy in and where we get it out. We want to watch that evolve in time. And that, that's the goal. So what do we want to learn from the whole study? Does biology use quantum coherence? Regardless of whether biology <laughs> uses it, can we make use of it? Is there an opportunity there? Is there a way to move energy more efficiently in an antenna, either a biological one or a synthetic one, by using quantum coherence? And then how do we, how do, we do that? How do we support it? And does the quantum coherence tell us something very fundamental about the system, about the biology? Is this a new way to probe systems? Is there information encoded in these quantum coherences that could be useful? Or a way to pull out the Hamiltonian, for example. Uh, and then finally, how robust is it? Is it some pinnacle of evolutionary finesse that biology has managed to make this gorgeous, perfectly balanced system? Or is it something a little less special? Is it something that we could do ourselves in a polymer matrix? Um, I mean, recreating an enzyme from scratch is a very hard task. Biology has many, many examples of very nice enzymes for us. We know it's possible, but we can't do it ourselves. On the other hand, uh, if this is something that's general that you that you really can't break and you can't you can't get it to go away, maybe it is a easy engineering goal. Maybe it's something that we can do. So either way, we're going to learn something uh, quite interesting. And then finally, we need the tools to be able to see this coherence. And I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, so I won't spend too much time on the tools today. Just uh, to give you a brief rundown of what we do for those of you who weren't at the talk. Uh, uh, so. When I talk to a biological audience, the first thing people tell me when I say 100 femtoseconds is nothing happens in biology in 100 femtoseconds. And you know, it may be true at some level, but there's actually a lot of motion on these fast time scales. That's not to say it's you know, folding or unfolding. These are very small motions. There are a lot of them. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot going on. There's this jiggling. All these chemical bonds are stretching. There's vibrational motion. So this is a classical uh, MD simulation, 277 Kelvin. And you can see even the chromophores are moving somewhat. 
You can imagine that their energy levels are fluctuating. You can imagine the couplings between them are fluctuating a little bit. Everything fluctuates, even on these femtosecond time scales. So this is that picosecond time scale now where the vast majority of the energy transfer has already occurred in the complex. These are the kinds of motions that we see. So when we think about this, we have to be very careful. It's not the Hamiltonian. It might be the average Hamiltonian, where there, you might say the off diagonal element is zero, but it's really zero plus or minus a little bit. You might say this is the energy, but it's really the energy plus or minus a bit. There are a lot of fluctuations in the system. We can average over an ensemble of different systems or watch one evolve in time. We get to the same uh, type of picture, at least for a thermal distribution. Uh, so how are we going to then probe this? How are we going to use these sorts of fluctuations in order to see correlations and see couplings? Uh, and our spectroscopy in a perturbative framework looks something like this. We put energy in, we create an excited state coherence. Eventually, we'll Fourier transform over this time. So time goes from bottom to top. And what we're going to see when we Fourier transform is the frequency difference between the ground and excited state. So we'll see the wavelength in which it absorbs. That's what we'll get when we Fourier transform over this waiting time because we'll see the phase evolve. Then we might have another waiting time where we just sit in the excited state. You can imagine if the excited state does something, if it evolves, if it moves, if it transfers the energy, we'll see it during this middle time. So this will be the time that I usually use on my spectrum when I show 1,000 femtoseconds. I mean I waited for 1,000 femtoseconds. And then finally, we force it a stimulated uh, emission signal or an absorption signal, which gives us another frequency here which may be the same, it may still be the difference between G and E, it may just be the excited state frequency, in which case we would get a signal right on the main diagonal. It's the same frequency during the first time as it is during the third time. And we can wait in between and see what happens. We can also uh, interact with different states. There were seven different chlorophylls that I can see in my spectroscopy, so it's possible that instead of interacting with the same state twice, I could interact with two different states in sequence. Rather than pumping one twice, I pumped the first one the first time and the second one the second time. I don't have control over which ones I pump. They all happen. But I can pull it out later. So for example, if I have two different excited states, one E and E prime at different frequencies, then my omega tau will differ from my omega t. Because at one point I will have pumped E prime, shown here in blue, and another time I'll see the frequency of the magenta omega. So I will be an off diagonal peak, and it will show up here. But interestingly, if I have this coherence, which means that I would be in a superposition state, I have a superposition somewhere in my system, this coherence will beat in time very slowly with this very low frequency beating during the waiting time. So this beats during this middle time, because I'm in two different states, report on a superposition nature in the system. So this is where it begins to get quantum mechanical. Rather than being in state one or in state two, it means that I should think about the system more as in a superposition between state one and state two. Now that's not something that you can have classically. You have to be in one state or another. Well, mechanically, it's no problem at all. It falls right out of linear algebra. It's neither surprising nor you know, particularly meaningful that you can have such a superposition. But there may be ways that you can take advantage of it. And that's actually the key. So whether it matters is the question. That we can create it is normal. And in fact, we would expect it to disappear in about 70 femtoseconds. We know by definition we must create it. Anytime you excite something, you end up with uh, an array of superposition states. That's normal. We're going to create these. But they should then die away in 70 femtoseconds, long before the transfer time of 100 femtoseconds to a picosecond that are relevant for the system. So you might say, ah, there's no opportunity to use this. But if you could protect it and have it persist, then there might be an opportunity to make use. And that's going to be one of the keys. So we're going to look for these low frequency beating modes. And we're going to ask, what information do they carry? Because it's something about differences in energy. That's where this omega comes from. And we're going to ask how long they last. Can they matter for the dynamics? Can they matter for the transport? Uh, so we also take into account all the other terms. This is a non-rephasing diagram. It has a similar beating frequency on the main diagonal. Uh, it comes out uh, only when we look at these non-rephasing spectra. But we do take everything into account. I just showed you a couple of representative examples. Uh, there are something like uh, four different families of pathways and approximately 24 different diagrams if you want to write out all the energy transfer possibilities. So it gets a little complicated and hairy, but we can tell which one we're seeing when we see it. Now, how do we do this? Well, the time scale of this measurement is defined by the femtosecond transfer, so we need very short laser pulses. We use 35 femtosecond pulses in this experiment. We know we need to put the energy in and take the energy out. So from a quirk from nonlinear optics, that means we need three pulses. You might have said, ah, oh, it means we need two, but there's an inversion symmetry problem for 
second order nonlinear response and an isotropic medium. So it means you need three. The third order nonlinear response is the lowest order signal that you're going to see. So I need to put in a series of three pulses, and then I get an echo signal out. Now, this is just like a cozy NMR sequence, except that I'm using higher energy photons for larger splittings. I have electronic splittings, not small spin splittings. There are upsides and downsides to that. One of the upsides is that my photons carry momentum. They carry a significant amount of momentum, and I can use this phase matching momentum conservation in order to put pulse 1, 2, and 3 into the sample, and they get a beam out in a unique direction in 4. So that's kind of fun. You don't usually think of this in optics, where you can put in laser, laser pulse 1, 2, 3, wait a little while, and get a beam out in a new direction. Uh, now, of course, that makes it very easy to detect, because nothing else comes out in that direction. So we try and use that. We can't phase cycle, we don't have that opportunity, but we can use the conservation of momentum so that I can simply block beams 1, 2, and 3 and only watch the signal come out in the direction of beam 4. That's the way we run the spectroscopy. In fact, we've gotten a little bit fancier so my students don't have to stay up all night, uh, and we realize that we can multiplex this and run many different delay times at once, and we do that, uh, and that makes, that makes my students much happier. Uh, that after a 44-hour run, uh, and I start I'm sure you did all the controls, they're ready to kill. Um, so now at least we, we get along a little bit better, and the data frankly looks a little bit cleaner, and that's a nice thing when you can go faster. And um, So what, when you see these plots, and I'm going to start showing you a lot of them, think about this x-axis is energy in, this y-axis is energy out, so this would be an energy transfer peak where you put energy in at this frequency but it came out at a lower frequency. Energy always runs up in both axes, whether I label it in wave numbers or wave length. So you might absorb at high energy and emit at low energy, that would give rise to this peak. A lot of information in here, but you can just think of it that way. But And the low frequency beating motions that I was talking about earlier, they would show up in one of these cross peaks sort of undulating and moving in time. And that's also a signature that you should look for when I show you these data sets. But here are two data sets. Here's the clock running at the bottom of both data sets. And you can just watch what happens. Now for the first 70 femtoseconds, we expect to see beating. We expect to see some wild type of uh, shape changes and motions on this out, that outside edge. You can see it especially where you see color changes. If your eye picks that up really well between green to blue or yellow to green, you can see this sort of motion. It looks kind of like a living, breathing thing. Uh, and now this clock is still running at 600 femtoseconds, and you still see these motions. You see these peaks breathing up and down. There's a lot going on still. Those, those superposition states, that quantum coherence persists. And this is 77 Kelvin, so it's cold for a biologist. It's warm for a quantum information scientist. They think nanokelvin Kelvin usually. Uh, so some people consider this hot, some people consider it cold, but it's 77 Kelvin, and we would predict from our theory that this should disappear in about 70 femtoseconds. And it's not, it's not a bad prediction. It's not that the theory is wrong. If I excite a superposition between a ground and excited state, it disappears in 70 femtoseconds. It matches the theory perfectly. And if I do that for any pair of ground and excited states, it disappears in 70 femtoseconds. But somehow between the excited states, they're not moving. So the question then becomes, how do you have two excited states that move rapidly relative to the ground state, but don't move rapidly relative to one another? And that's an interesting picture. Uh, so that tells you that there's, there's something going on here. Now, from this, when you see these sort of oscillations, if you're uh, a chemist, first thing you say is, oh, well, that looks a lot like noise. You know, like we, we have noise in our experiments, too. It's true. Um, so the question then is, are these sorts of oscillations, are they, are they really science oil? Can we understand, why does it go away right here? But that, that seems strange, and it looks like it almost comes back a little bit. Um, so reasons to be a little skeptical. So the first thing you might ask is, is it reproducible? So we run the same experiment on three different samples, all generously donated from Bob, uh, and we appreciate that. I, can't, I really can't appreciate that. Um, we run out three different days, three different layers of alignments, three different samples, prepared by three different students. Um, I really was trying to take no chances on this. And uh, so this is, you know, approximately six days of my students sleep for the old experiments. They agree in phase and frequency. Um, so in this particular run, I had a student refill the cryostat at 1800 femtoseconds, which is really about 30 hours in. A little liquid nitrogen got on the table. So that caused our steel table to contract a little bit, and I can't run for the next 12 hours, and that was the end of that experiment. Um, get, so this is why I also had three different students do it. They were at each other's throat. Um, the other two only got 1,200 before doing something silly. Uh, but this happened. The, the point is, uh, we, we do have a good data run. The one that went up to 2,000 is a little clean. But um, they all agree in phase and frequency. These were our first three tries. This is reproducible. 
the, the, the humps are always in the same place. They're always the same magnitude. We see something. We see something going on here. And I'm just looking at the beating at one point now. I'm just picking at one point in this cross peak down here, and we're watching what happens. Now, of course, we can also change the temperature. So we can uh, raise the temperature from 77 Kelvin towards something like 277 Kelvin, which is uh, close to physiological temperature. That's a cold room temperature if you're working with proteins. Uh, and you know, Shaw Mukamel likes to tease me by saying that this is room temperature in Chicago. Um, <laughs> Californians, I tell you. Uh, but uh, actually, cold room. Um, we're, we're going to have him come to the seminar in February. Anyway, but uh, so this is now uh, near room temperature. And here we would expect the phasing to happen in 15 femtoseconds, so right about here. And that, again, that prediction is good. That's, in fact, why you see almost no features in the spectrum. That we're putting energy in by using that single quantum coherence. That's what gives us this axis. We're taking energy out the same way, using a single quantum coherence. Those both dephase in 15 femtoseconds, so you get lifetime broadening. You can just see some big round curve. But the zero quantum coherences that are under there show oscillations that persist for about 400 femtoseconds, which is a time scale that's relevant for the energy transfer in this system. So even at a physiological temperature, 277 Kelvin, near room temperature, we see that these oscillations persist. And they agree in phase and frequency with the same oscillations that we see at low temperature. And we can follow them as we go forward. You can see that they die out a little faster at 125 and 150. And then you know, even faster yet by the time we get at 277 Kelvin. There's a glass transition in this protein. Uh, in this, there are a lot of changes. but. This process seems to be pretty general. It persists at low temperature, it works at physiological temperature, and again, it's about 30 times, 20 to 30 times longer than we might expect. If you said 15 femtoseconds and call this around 300, it's a factor of 20. So that's something that's interesting. There's also exponential dynamics. You can see that there's some sort of exponential decay behind this as well. So that would be the incoherent Forster-like uh, rate constants you see from freshman chemistry where you just get exponential dynamics. It's not that there's only coherent transfer or only incoherent transfer. We're in this intermediate regime that's rather interesting where we see both. So if I subtract the exponentials and just show you the fit of the beating pattern, you get something like this. So this is 77 Kelvin. You can see it lasts 1,800 femtoseconds. Here's 125, 150. Here's 277. And while this looks short compared to that, it's still long compared to 15 femtoseconds if you look at this time scale. There really is beating that's persisting quite a while. Uh, and if we fit the dephasing rates to a line, you can see that we get up to about 200 wave numbers, 250 wave numbers by the time we're at physiological temperature. So that's a number to just kind of keep in the back of your head, that the dephasing rate near room temperature is about 200 wave numbers, uh, because that's something we're going to come back to in just a moment. And of course, it does change a little bit. We can learn something about how this works uh, from these changes. There's a lot of information in here. But 200 wave numbers at room temperature, just kind of by the way, because we want to ask, does this do anything? So a number of theorists, Alain Spiroguzic at Harvard, Martin Plenio, uh, then at Imperial, now at Ulm in Germany, uh, started to look at this. And they found something very interesting in their models. Once we suggested that coherent transport may play a role, they, being theorists, created an axis that goes from the manifestly coherent limit to the manifestly incoherent limit. Now, I mean, thermally, this would be like temperature of the sun. But they then asked something only a theorist can love. But it's an interesting thought experiment. What happens is you would go smoothly from a purely coherent dynamics to a purely incoherent dynamics. And what you see is the efficiency, as modeled by this blue line, for, for the FMO Hamiltonian published by uh, Adolf and Rayner, it starts at about 75, 76%. And if you start to add more dephasing, you reach a maximum of about 98%. Uh, and that happens is somewhere between 100 and 300. He actually lost a factor of pi. This was from a preprint. Line should be at 300 wave number. It happens, you know, in this broad open range between 100 and 300. So 100 is what we see at liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, actually, a little bit less. It's down here. And around 200 to 300 is what we see at room temperature. It's right at the top of this peak, where you would expect to see the most efficient transport. This means you have an interplay between this coherent wave-like motion that you get from watching a superposition wave packet wash back and forth. Um, if it didn't dephase, it would wash back and forth forever. Stuck, you get Anderson localization. If it dephases too quickly, then you get this hopping and this thermal uh, process, and then the efficiency begins to drop. And in fact, you can reach a Zeno regime at some absurdly high temperature where you're making observations so quickly that it freezes it in place, which is also a somewhat quantum mechanical effect, but 
not one that we can access experimentally. Uh, but the point here <coughs> is that as you go from coherent to incoherent, there's an optimal. There's, there's an optimality condition. You can do better by mixing these two mechanisms than you can with either mechanism alone. So this is something that really caught our attention. So, and not only that, when we do the temperature experiment, it shows that we're right at that maximum. It tells you that the system may be optimized. There have been a lot of work by John Chu Cao and Bob Silby and Seth Lloyd now to show that FMO is optimal to perturbations in terms of size, coupling, dielectric, phasing rate, and many other different, uh, uh, different uh, coordinates. Yes? Please. So, I'm trying to think about the phasing rates in reciprocal. Sorry. So, so on these diagrams, your new, that's not the oscillation frequency. The, my new so is the oscillation, oscillation frequency. frequency. Yep. Then you've got the rate and time that happens away. That, that's right. And then on your previous slide, you have the population trend, exponential. That, that's that's so correct. Could you give us a feel for the rate at which the oscillation dies away compared to the rate at which exponential? Yes. A absolutely. That's what I mean. a absolutely. So if, let's just look at this top panel as an example because we see a lot of oscillations. So the frequency of the oscillation that I see is 158 wave numbers plus or minus 2. That's, in fact, the energy difference between exciton 1 and exciton 2. So it's simply the first semester graduate quantum mechanics, e to the negative of IET over h bar. You take the difference between the two, you get 160 wave numbers, and that's the beat frequency. But now you see, also see a decay rate. And now maybe you might think about this, as, since it's exponential, as having a lifetime. So you might say, ah, oh, I should characterize that in femtoseconds, and I might get something that says an e-folding time might be, let's say, 1,000 femtoseconds. Now, using the speed of light, if I have something in time, and uh, I want to take uh, inverse time, and then uh, divide by the speed of light, it goes to inverse centimeters. So I have e to the negative kt for our rate constant, which would be in units of inverse time, second. In, uh, to the negative one, I multiply or divide by the speed of light and it goes to inverse centimeters. So in the units of inverse centimeters, this, this dephasing rate that looks like a lifetime about uh, one picosecond shows up here at about uh, 30 wave numbers. It's that blue point just at the beginning here. And I'll actually show you what the real number is. I'm just reading it off the graph. It's approximately 30 here. I'll have it on the next slide where it's fit explicitly. But that's, that's where we get the inverse centimeters. We go from inverse seconds as a rate constant Divide by the speed of light, we get inverse centimeters. So if you look at about a thousand wave, a thousand femtoseconds for a dephasing time, that comes out to be about 30 wave numbers. Uh, and with a speed of light at 300 nanometers per femtosecond, you know that's where the 30 comes from. Compared to the exponential rate, population. Yes. So, so if we if we look at what's the uh, rate constant here, it's it looks like it's about uh, 500, 600, just by eye, I would say. And maybe there's some pulse overlap effects, so maybe we should start from here and go down to an e-folding time and say it's closer to 700. But they're on the same order. And that's precisely why we're in this intermediate regime where we have both the coherent and the incoherent. That if it were purely coherent dynamics, uh, then we would find ourselves over here. If we're purely incoherent, we find ourselves over there. When they're approximately matched, there's this big flat plateau. And that's, that's the key design aspect of this that I think is exciting. Uh, now, how should you think about this if you, if you don't really like quantum mechanics and you do like cartoons? If it's the other way around, you should ignore this slide. Um, but you think about this motion through the antenna to the reaction center. Now, in bacteria, we see a very interesting pattern where, to a good approximation, farther you are away from the reaction center, the higher energy uh, you might absorb. So you tend to be bluer farther away, redder as you get closer, and there's, there's some semblance of order. Is it really as ordered as I showed it? Probably not. It's a cartoon. But you can imagine navigating this classically, where you might have a, a little you know, BB rolling down this grassy slope, getting stuck on every blade of grass, and bouncing back and forth thermally, and eventually finding its way to the bottom. That would be a hopping process. Now, if you're not in one state at a time, but you're in many states at once, a superposition, think of it more like uh, a beach ball rolling down this hill. You don't feel just one peak or valley at a time. You feel many. You're going from one set of superpositions, one set of one superposition to another superposition, many states at once. And then you're going to see this roll down rather smoothly, 
And collapse, when you get charge separation, you have one overall interaction with your environment, you have immediate dephasing. So that's where, you know, so the beach ball rolls down the hill and pops. That's the mechanism. Now, if you don't have this semblance of order, it's more like what you might see in PS1 and plants, where you see uh, high and low energy spread all over, now navigating this classically is rather tricky. It, you, you don't get there. Um, now, on the other hand, if you have this sort of superposition that rolls back and forth, it effectively contracts your phase space. So if you think of this thermodynamically, you're in many states at once. It takes much less time to sample the ensemble. Uh, and then suddenly, you can kind of roll smoothly until you collapse. And you'll only collapse when you have access to a charge-separated state, uh, or perhaps to a carotenoid. There are options anytime you have fast dynamics that interact with a vibrational bath or uh, electronic bath. You'll get this collapse. So it's a way that you can search this very broad phase space very quickly. And it effectively collapses the size of the phase space. And in fact, these signals that I just showed you, that I'm showing you in FMO, have now been found in LHC2. They are in fact brighter there. You see, you see very strong beats uh, in LHC2 from higher plants. And this design principle is apparent in bacteria, but we can easily imagine that it's going to be more important in our models as we start to build simple models for higher plants. So this is interesting. It's how you can navigate a disordered landscape efficiently. Don't get stuck in the traps. And that's something that is important. Now, you were asking about what are the different frequencies and what are the different dephasing rates. If you were bothered by the fact that this didn't really look like a good sine wave, the reason is because I have my lowest state here, 1, and then I have 2 through 7 up in this mess, in this peak at the top. So the cross peak that I'm looking at isn't truly just a 1, 2 cross peak. It also has a little bit of a 1, 3 component to it. The 1, 3 energy difference is about 200 wave numbers. So we actually see two beat frequencies. It's not that the thing was noisy. If we fit this to two sinusoids, then it matches quite well. Uh, that, then we see pretty good agreement between the data and the model. And one of them, the low end frequency, dephases with a 30 wave number uh, dephasing rate. The 200 wave number, the 1 3 coherence, is closer to a 50 wave number dephasing rate. Um, and this comes from a least squared spit. And this got us thinking because we, we didn't expect to see such a slow dephasing rate when we first started. I kind of I tried to make that point by saying theory said 70 times per second, we see hundreds. That's odd. But we also uh, we also didn't expect to see it be different. But that's also interesting. That tells you that these dephasing rates themselves are somehow reporting on the nature of the bat around the states. So we might be able to get information out of the fact that different excitons dephase at different frequencies. How to make sense of that information may be another issue, but at least we can start to measure them. Uh, so we did that. We went in and we started looking at all the different beat frequencies. We applied a Z transform, which is simply uh, a Fourier transform where you allow the frequency to be an imaginary number, so you incorporate a dephasing rate. And we can create these for any trace like this. We could Fourier transform it. We get something like this. You can see the sync function and the instrument line width broadening the system. Or we can go and we can apply the Z transform and then take a cut. You can see that you've improved your resolution significantly, but you also see that different beats have very different dephasing rates. So here's that one at 160 with the slowest dephasing rate we find. Here's the, uh, sorry, there's the one at 200. There's also uh, a 260 because we took this big box now. So we're also getting some high frequency beats out on this edge between, say, 1 and 6, or uh, it may even be a little 2 and 6 there. Uh, and we were able to assign all of these based on our knowledge of the Hamiltonian and show that different pairs dephase at different rates. It's not just that high frequencies, or sorry, low frequencies dephase slowly, high frequencies can also dephase quite slowly. Um, and, but some, high, some low frequencies dephase quite quickly. There's, there's a wealth of information inside this, and we can start to compare this with quantum mechanical models, QMMM simulations of the protein, which are currently being run by Alana Spru, to try and match all of them. This data is from chloromium tepidum. Alana's model is from estuary I. We had a little bit of a miscommunication. Um, so we're, we're rerunning the model, which unfortunately is a supercomputer. Uh, we're also rerunning the data. I'll show you the rest of it. Uh, but we had a terrible miscommunication. Um, but he also sees a pattern. It's very similar to this, but not exact, but it's also a different protein. We're, we're trying to work our way through this. Uh, now, how should you think about this sort of microscopically? I gave you some big cartoon picture with uh, phenomenological states earlier. Here's a cartoon picture where you think about it microscopically, where you have states that couple to one another. So yesterday I talked about fluctu random fluctuations of one chromophore causing correlated motion between the mixed states. That's in fact how we get our cross peaks. The same is true over here. 
But if both this state and this state are moving randomly, these guys, while they may be somewhat correlated, uh, we're going to have a problem. That we're going to have a psi 1 plus psi 2, a psi 1 minus psi 2. These fluctuations are unlikely to actually uh, be fully correlated to give us this factor of 30. It's not going to work. Uh, especially a system that's not fully delocalized like FMO. But if these feel the same vibrations, then these two states are also locked together. And suddenly we don't see dephasing. So if you see the same vibrational fluctuations on one chromophore as you do on the other, then all of a sudden we have an easy way to make sure the excited states move in tandem. So this can move relative to the ground state. This can move relative to its ground state. But if they move together, there's no dephasing. Uh, in an NMR lingo, this is a decoherence-free subspace. That's also a quantum information uh, notion. So we, if we know the structure of the noise, say that it's correlated, there will be states that don't deface. And that, I think, is a, a good way to explain it. It's not the only way, and I'll show you another a uh, little more complicated one. But this, this is what we thought was going on. This idea was published uh, by Ho Jae Lee, uh, Duan Chung Chang, and Graham Fleming in 2007 in Science. Uh, but there's a little bit more to the story. It's still a good start. So we went in and we said, well, microscopically, if it's going to be a fluctuation that both chromophores feel, let's look at what they might feel. Let's look at atoms that are within a few angstroms of the chlorophylls that are part of the protein. Let's look at the phytal chains. And let's just you know, take a view of what's going on inside this protein. Which ones are close? Which ones might affect multiple chromophores? And there are some parts of the protein that might do that. And there are certainly the final chains that could have that effect. So let's go in and try and modify them. So this is when I go and I knock on Bob's door and say, hey, I've got this great idea for an easy, easy experiment. And he looks at me like I'm nuts and says, we don't have good genetics in this yet. We can't make this mutant. Uh, and then uh, a student uh, in Bob's group, uh, Jing Zhang Wen, uh, came up with an elegant answer saying, grow it in some deuterium. But then I go back to Bob and say, ah, I've got a great idea. Let's grow in deuterium. <laughs> Looks at me like I'm nuts again. <laughs> Do you have any idea how much deuterium is going to be? <laughs> um, the answer is a lot. So we did this. Um, well, we, we uh, did this growth process. And we got uh, something very interesting. We also found a naturally occurring mutant that doesn't mature its spinal chain. It leaves a geronial, geronial chain. So we're able to then look at the beat frequencies of what happens in the native system where we have a gamma 1 of 30 and gamma 2 in this case, but we've gotten better at knowing where all the different beats are, so we, we've uh, gotten cleaner signals. Uh, so then we looked at this, uh, this geronial, geronial chain on the bacterial chlorophyll, drawn sort of schematically without any tail at all because it's modified. No difference within experimental error. Uh, it would take only a few wave numbers of difference to make this drop off at about 500 uh, femtoseconds. Then we just did a random 30% deuteration. Now this is a really neat experiment because now every member of the ensemble is different. The fact that they're different is confirmed by mass spec. So if there were some simple vibrational mode, say 150 wave number ring bending mode in the chlorophyll, there is one, uh, that were responsible for this kind of oscillation, even with deuteration, CD, you change the normal modes, especially at low frequencies, just slightly, a small rotation, so we did 10,000 realizations of quantum chemical calculations with deuterium randomly put around a chlorophyll. Instead of getting a sharp vibration at 150, you get things that range from 140 to 155 wave numbers. So only 10 or 15 wave numbers. You put that in the calculation to see how fast it will dephase. It will cause dephasing, and the beating will completely disappear by 500 femtoseconds. And we did this for a number of modes. It's always the case that with this 30% deuteration, that beating should be gone by 500 femtoseconds at liquid nitrogen temperature if this were coming from some interplay with a specific vibrational mode. Now, there are always 150 wave number low frequency motions in a protein. It's a whole sea of these things. They're phonon modes. Um, but, and deuterating them doesn't seem to uh, have any effect on that C per se, but it should affect any local mode. So this is not some perfectly tuned, simple vibration right next to the chromophore. It's something a bit more general. Uh, and in fact, if I cross link this protein using a zero length cross linker and try and sort of staple it up to make it stiffer, no observable change there either. Uh, we're still working on some MALDI uh, experiments to confirm that my cross linking was successful, so I cut that panel off the bottom of the scratch. But uh, no observable change there either. So we tried to stiffen it, we tried to break it by changing the duration, we tried to look at different tails. If it's something, if that's the role of the final chain, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, so I had a very frustrated student at this point. We had a lot of null results. 
Uh, I had been telling him it's some pinnacle of evolutionary finesse, and he's coming back saying, I can't break it no matter what I do. Um, we'd reached an impasse. But then as we started to think about it, if you can't break it, and it just has to do with the excitonic differences, maybe you can use this to your advantage. Maybe you can exploit these coherences to get new information about the underlying Hamiltonian. I mean, if you can't change it, it's something pretty fundamental. So we went in and we started to do that. We started to look at, uh, you know, from the simple uh, first day graduate quantum aspect, that the, if we took it, look at this uh, Schrodinger equation, we see that these energy differences are just the phases that would come from a superposition state. So all the energy differences should be encoded by these beat frequencies. So if we take that and we Fourier transform over the waiting time, suddenly instead of getting just one cross peak that we can look at, we now have 19 cross peaks. 19 of 21, in fact. Uh, this is a big improvement. Our resolution has changed immensely by Fourier transforming over this waiting time after subtracting the exponential dynamics, so we get rid of the real low frequency uh, incoherent dynamics, and looking just at these beats and trying to fit this. And what we can see is that in the upper diagonal, we can see that there are excitons above uh, exciton 1, or sorry, lower diagonal, excitons above exciton 1, and in the upper diagonal, we can see excitons below exciton 7. We can actually fit this and find the entire Hamiltonian by looking above exciton 1 or below exciton 7. The black lines are just the guidelines on where you'd expect to see the peaks. Now, occasionally, you see a peak that's off of the guideline. You kind of look at it and say, ah, maybe there's something wrong. But then you realize that some of these, like this 2, 5 coherence, are really strong compared to what we see down here. And this is just a, a little bit of the tail of this peak, because it's a, it's a big sphere, and you're taking a cut below it, and you're just seeing a little bottom edge of it. So that's what this guy is. Um, and similarly, you can go through and find you know, that this one shows up in multiple places as well. But you can see below exciton 7, you can line up exciton 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And if you're a little clever, you can argue for 1. But you, really, you can get all the energy differences between them, and you can use this to build up the entire Hamiltonian. So you can use this then to extract the Hamiltonian, and we've done that. Um, we also wanted to think about this, uh, the, if the coherences were good for anything else. So, so we can pull a Hamiltonian out of them. That works. Uh, we can get a fully experimental Hamiltonian. It's nice. We go to 19 cross peaks. We also want to ask ourselves about the difference between classical and quantum dynamics. And in, in a classical regime, the coherences disappear due to this dephasing rate very quickly, and you're just left with simple exponential dynamics. This Pauli master equation that you teach in the first uh, semester of freshman chemistry, it's Arrhenius. It's the e to the negative kt type of behavior. Uh, that's what you get when you integrate this differential equation. Uh, and that assumes that the coherences just disappear fast. I already showed you that they last a long time. So as soon as you get to a point where they can persist, you get dynamics that are not just the simple exponential, this green Forster type transfer, incoherent transfer, exponential dynamics. You also get the red coherent transfer, one superposition to another. And you get a weird state that we didn't know how to think of, a weird relaxation we didn't know how to think about, where the coherence can drive a population. Or the population can lend lifetime to a coherence. It has to go both ways. Uh, that's the nature of all of these couplings from the symmetries in the Hamiltonian. And we want to specifically look for this blue term. Well, see, can we see it? Is it there? Does it matter? What's it do? So we went after this quantum transport term, and we're able to find it. We're able to uh, come up with a very simple model for how to look for it. That if we look at this uh, red field uh, relaxation superoperator in the master equation, what we find is from this term, coherences should oscillate. This just gives you an oscillatory term if you were to integrate this and ignore that. But for populations, this goes to zero. EI minus EI equals zero, so you get no oscillation, but you do get that the derivative is equal to some constant kappa multiplied by the coherence. Derivative of a sine equals a cosine, right? That's, that's all that I'm saying here. This is simple trigonometry, but the derivative of the sine equals a cosine. I would expect to see a 90 degree phase shift between this oscillatory uh, coherence and beating in this population. I'd expect to see the population be 90 degrees off from the coherence. And that's the signature we want. There are lots of ways, if you look at a tail of a peak way over here, you might see something in phase just from a ripple. Uh, but you don't see 90 degree phase shifts that way. Though 90 degree phase shift is very diagnostic. If it's coming in our signal, this is why. So we said, let's take a look. Let's look at the diagonal, which Yuan Chung Chen tells us in his theory papers should not beat. Uh, the only way it would beat is if you see this type of pattern. So we did that. So we look at a diagonal, we look at an off-diagonal term. This one is the one I've been showing you all along, the coherence beating. 
No new information here. Same fit I showed you before. Uh, on top, however, I've only allowed uh, three free constants. One phase shift, which gets to uh, approximately 90 degrees, and two kappas, two relaxation operators, uh, to see how much of these, each of these two frequencies goes into this. And you know, is it perfect? It's not quite perfect. But if you look at a maximum here, it, it comes to a node up there. You look at a maximum here, it comes to a node down there. You can just follow these dotted lines if you're sitting in the front rows and can see them. It's an exactly a 90 degree fish. This is telling us that this coherence is driving the population. It also tells you that the population is lending lifetime to the coherence. This is a very general mechanism, much more general than that correlation notion I was telling you about. Get long-lived coherences. It doesn't require long-range spatial correlations. It just requires simple system bath patterns in the system bath Hamiltonian. Uh, this is much better because all the simulations don't show correlations. Searching for this now for four years since that idea came out, no MD simulation shows correlations inside these proteins at the line scales that are necessary. Um, however, this, it's clear that this coherence is driving the population, therefore this population is giving lifetime to that coherence. This is a general model, which includes the correlations as one possibility, but it's more general and this in fact can explain it in the absence of correlations. So this gives us a much more microscopic, uh, much more microscopic insight for how to look at the system bath couplings in MD simulations, and we're working on this now. It also means, since the populations must sum to one, the trace of the density matrix has to be equal to one. If one of these is oscillating, it means another one must be oscillating to compensate. FMO is not symmetric. It's why I love it as a spectroscopist. All the different states have different energies. If I have two populations oscillating with different energy. My model does not conserve energy. So this presents a little bit of a problem, right? I mean, we, we like conservation of energy. As a physicist, this is something that, that I prize. Uh, so what's the issue? Well, clearly it's not that energy conservation is violated. I don't want anyone leaving the room thinking that that theory is out the window. Energy is conserved in the universe. And to a good approximation, energy is conserved in this complex. But energy is not conserved within the chlorophylls of this complex. The chlorophylls are trading energy with the protein reversibly. And that's why you're seeing these populations oscillate back and forth. Now, this is upsetting to a chemist, because when energy goes into a thermal bath, it doesn't come back. I mean, the, I mean we, we assume that thermal baths are incoherent. The entropy must go up, uh, right, in number of degrees of freedom to the n, and n is large. We should not see this thermal bath give energy back to the system reversibly like this. It tells you that some of this bath is driven coherently by the excitation. It's not purely a thermal bath. So you're moving energy back and forth reversibly because the bath is coupled to the system. System bath coupling in the Hamiltonian. That's precisely what gives rise to this relaxation in the first place. So it's like a Rabi oscillation. You're coupled, you're strongly coupled to the bath, but you're coupled coherently. Now, what does that mean for a whole burning experiment or reorganization energy? These notions that insist on an incoherent bath, this type of system bath coupling would be invisible. So what would you predict from this? You'd say, well, I would assume then that if I did an incoherent measurement like reorganization energy or hole burning, I would expect to see extremely low electron phonon coupling, extremely low system bath coupling in those experiments, lower than would be reasonable for a chromophore in a polarizable protein. Well, look at the history of photosynthetic spectroscopy. What you see is we see extremely low electron phonon coupling, far lower than we would predict, and we see very little reorganization energy, and we say, well, that's why it's so efficient. If I ask you, to, as chemists, to create something with a reorganization energy of 20 wave numbers, they scratch their head. A thousand wave numbers, fine. We can get enormous stoke shifts. Look at all the laser dyes that you see. They large stoke shifts. You don't get that here. This is this this is hard to do. Uh, but it's because the system bath coupling is partitioned to coherent and incoherent co components. Coherent components don't cause the energy to be permanently lost. The in, I'm sorry, the coherent components don't cause the energy to be permanently lost. The incoherent components do. So. There's this aspect of the system bath coupling where there's a very complex relationship between the exciton and its bath. And that's something we can't create in artificial systems. But the writing's on the wall. This is a goal to make very efficient uh, absorption in solar cells or in other light harvesting systems. We have to figure out how to do it. Okay, so what does this mean? It doesn't conserve energy. Energy is traded back and forth between the protein and the bacteria chlorophylls. The mathematics for it will fit exactly to a Rabi oscillation, but I note that there is no driving field. Typically, Rabi is trading energy between a photon field and a molecule. Here, it's trading energy between a molecule and its bath. Same idea, same equations. 
different coupling element, but same mathematics. Uh, and also, this is a wave-like transport. The energy moves back and forth. You really do see populations oscillate, and we can see that experimentally. And the protein interaction is relatively nonspecific, meaning that it's not a single mode. The deuterium doesn't affect it. But it is still shaped. There is still some pattern in here that's important. And we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to unravel that. So uh, what's the lesson? The bath matters. Coupling to the environment is the key. We need to not just think about engineering the system. We need to think about engineering the bath around it. I call this environmental engineering, but I get laughed out of engineering. You have to engineer the environment around the chromophores to make this work. Um, that's, in fact, exactly what the protein has evolved to do in some sense. It's engineering the environment around the chromophores. But I don't think this is as hard as it might sound. The fact that we can't break it is encouraging. Um, it's not good from a biophysical standpoint because I can't learn anything by trying to break it. But it means that it's a pretty general phenomenon. So I think we can use this. I think this is an opportunity. Uh, so where do we go from here? Um, well, we want to think about different complexes. I mentioned SQRI because of a bit of a miscommunication with Alon. Uh, it turns out these spectra are absolutely gorgeous. We get far better resolution in the SQRI spectra than we do in the tepidum spectra. We can see very clear cross peaks. You can see why we see multiple beat frequencies. There are, in fact, multiple cross peaks showing up. So the resolution here is far better. We can even see the peak shape change, which is the first time a cross peaks peak kick has been seen to change and rotate. Um, and that gives you very clean beating signals, cleaner than the following the amplitude will. So we have better ways to extract the signals. We can get the information properly. Interestingly, by eye, I didn't expect to see much difference. These chromophores look, or these proteins look almost identical. Um, now I'm just looking at the backbone here, so maybe it's cheating. But uh, they're similar. They're very similar. And yet the spectrum is rather different, and the coherent dynamics are surprisingly similar as well. So you can move around the spectrum without changing the coherent dynamics. Uh, and that's something that we find very interesting. So we're digging into this complex. It's still all a bit premature. Uh, but uh, our first papers are submitted on this. Atom ones are still there. Uh, and from there, we're just trying to think, can we use this quantum biology to understand new theory, like that environmentally assisted quantum transport, the ENAQT model I was showing you, where you have an optimality condition and an interplay between coherent and incoherent dynamics? Can we use that to then create new materials, conjugated polymers, dendromers, linked quantum dots? Can we use that to try and create a synthetic model of the same thing. Because if I can't break it in a protein, I need more control. There will be a way to break this if I can get a synthetic model that reproduces. So we're going after that. We're also thinking about using those same models and devices and trying to get information about the phase and the mode of the photon from the device. And there are a lot of examples where that would be useful. Uh, so with that, again, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators this work. And it's not done with my hands on the laser knobs or me growing the protein. It's just uh, I don't have. Uh, out of the time and the skill to do all of that. So uh, my students have put in an enormous amount of work on this project. And all the results that I show you today really are theirs, uh, much more than mine. Uh, in particular, uh, Git Kanichi Gankun, Dugan Hayes, Justin Carr, Walat Harrell, uh, Kelly Francis, who helped build the instruments. These are the ones that really powered this. Uh, the samples came from uh, Jing Chong Wen and Bob Blankenship's group. Uh, so they were homegrown. Uh, you know, this is, without these samples that are so clean, there's no way we could see these types of signals. Um, and then uh, for the quantum transport, Shaw Mukamel at uh, UC Irvine, Alon for his help and discussions with the modeling, uh, and then funding. Uh, thank you guys very much for your attention. Hey. For two questions. Do we? So I have two, two questions. Aaron, can you get the last? So the first question is, is aren't you, you mentioned that one of the things you think drives the uh, phenomenon is having connecting to really relatively low reorganization. So don't you think that the system has come a long way towards that by basically not polar chromophores and effectively a non polar environment? Since the chlorophylls are relatively non-polar, apparently the environment is not loaded up with ionizing or So it's sort of set up to help. But if I look at a pyromethene dye in a non-polar solvent, I see enormous reorganization energies compared to what I see here. And that's true for many uh, non-polar chromophores and non-polar solvents. So while I agree that that's a better situation than a polar chromophore and a polar solvent, unquestionably, so it is part of that, it's not the only aspect. They, they have. They do. They do have. Uh, 
they do have relatively small shifts, though that, that's absolutely true. I think there are, I, there, I think there are many aspects of, of uh, trying to eliminate this reorganization energy. And you have to eliminate it or you bleed off a ton of energy at every step along the way. So it has to be, it has to be uh, beaten down as much as possible. And you're right, the shape of the, the choice of the molecule is important. The choice of the environment is important. And what we see here is uh, in the chlorophyll systems, I think, is still anomalously low, even taking all of this into account. And I think there's also an additional aspect where you're partitioning whatever coupling is left to the system, to the bath, between a coherent and an incoherent part. The incoherent part is lost, but the coherent part you can regain. So I think that this is just one, I think it's one more piece. Uh, I do think that what we see in these protein complexes is still surprisingly low reorganization compared to heteroperols in solution. But I do agree with you that they are some of the best actors that we've got in terms of this. They, they're good. So the, um, it seems to me that if you're, if you're you trying to um, eliminate the coherence in trouble, and as you said, you have two sites and they're bouncing around because the proteins move, move independently. To eliminate the, to, to get rid of the coherence, what you want to do is have one, in the simplest picture, have one molecule move in distance or orientation. With yes, if you change a coupling so element and off diagonal. That's the simplest way to do it. Yes. And, and one of the questions is, is are the sites in the fifth? If you look at like temperature factors in different regions, is there a correlation between the temperature factors in different protein versus the rate at which the has to be phased for this? So uh, we've we've not looked at it that way, and that's a that's a very good idea to use the temperature factors. We've been trying to do it uh, from scratch with simulation, um, but I think you're absolutely right that that the same information that we're going at is accessed experimentally in the crystal structures from the various temperature factors, and I'll look at that. That's, we have been waiting for simulations, and you're probably right that we don't have to. Um, so no, I haven't looked at it. I think it's a great idea, uh, and that will be very interesting. You're also right that while I spoke about fluctuations of the diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian, fluctuations of the off-diagonal elements cause rapid dephasing because it causes the states to move away from one another. Whether it's orientation or distance, it doesn't matter. It's the off-diagonal coupling elements that would really drive rapid dephasing. Those will fluctuate as well. Uh, apparently, apparently surprisingly little, actually. But in general, anything that's going to move the energy of uh, a site will also cause fluctuations in the off diagonal elements, largely because of the mean field approximations and the dielectric, that if through space coupling, changing the dielectric constant as compared to distance in a constant dielectric gives you exactly the same effect. So any motion in between the chromophores changes the dielectric and will change the coupling element. And it's one of the reasons we find it surprising. I don't claim to understand it, but you're right. So your simulations are all on monomers, is that right? On protein monomers? They, they are They are on protein do, do monomers. Do you expect that there would be much difference if you actually went to trimeric so, complex? Uh, or? The QMMM simulations that Alon has done are trimeric complexes, um, and he doesn't see doesn't see much difference um, when he looks at the chromophore pockets on this time scale, which isn't so unexpected because we're starting from the crystal structure, we're equilibrating. Um, so he does now do trimers, and the answer is we don't see a significant difference. We trust the trimers more. Because that's that's the realistic system. Um, so we're, try we're trying that. Um, like I said, there's a little bit of a miscommunication <laughs> has kept us from having any answer to that just yet. But, I'm surprised okay. at the at the difference between the spectra in the estuary and the tepidum, I would have predicted they would have been very, very similar. And, I mean, the linear spectra are surprisingly similar with a little, a little There's difference. There's a little difference. Yeah, but yeah. not much. Right. So, in fact, we took this data and it sat for a number of months because we figured, oh, there's so much in the tepidum. We'll get to that later, but it's the same. And then finally, this forced us to get to it. And uh, I got a very sheepish knock on my door saying, <laughs> you know, we've chosen the wrong complex. Uh, so speaking of trimers, I think the eighth chlorophyll. So I think the eighth chlorophyll uh, will answer a long-standing question of how does the energy get in to the system. Uh, at, now, do I think it will have, play a large role in the coherent dynamics? Yes, I, I really don't know. But if you had, if I had to place a bet, I would say probably not. But I suspect what you're going to see. You know, I create the coherence by timing everything with a laser. Um, but 
that for the dynamics to be important to transport, it only means that hop has to be fast. Uh, so if you hop from the eighth chlorophyll into like, uh, exciton 7, exciton 6 in the top of the system, the fluctuation that causes that instantaneous resonance, right, the fret hopping, that will be the clock for this particular complex. And you will see the coherent dynamics affect the transport efficiency, even if you don't see the whole ensemble being in sync. So seeing these coherent dynamics requires you to synchronize the ensemble. So that's why we need the laser to do it. But the overall dynamics and transport efficiency doesn't require a coherent initialization. That's an experimental artifact that I need to get a macroscopic signal. Um, so I think the eighth chlorophyll will show you how you get the energy in. And then I think we'll see the coherent dynamics. I think that's going to be the motif that plays uh, over and over again in photosynthesis. You get coherent dynamics over short ranges, and then you get a hop, and you get more coherent dynamics to accelerate again. Uh, I don't think that you're going to move through an entire antenna in some purple membrane uh, coherently. I think that you're going to see a hop, coherent burst, incoherent dynamics, a hop, coherent burst, incoherent dynamics. But we can't get an ensemble synchronized to see that yet. Uh, so I'd love to get a sample of uh, FMO attached to a reaction center. This is where I uh, elbow you in the ribs a little. We're working on it. Uh, <laughs> so we can actually look to see how it goes from one complex to another. Um, and there may be other opportunities to do that. But the FMO we see well, and it's well resolved. And the reaction center is actually favorable with it. So you know, that's one that we do want to look at. But the eighth chlorophyll, it's, it's the route in. How you get how you get into the complex, but I doubt it is coherently coupled. It just seems too far. It's I fairly it's weakly surprised. coupled. I mean, the yeah, that's it. It's it's too far away. It's the coupling's too weak. I don't think it'll affect the coherent dynamics. I think it's going to be how you move the energy into the system. One thing that you have to be careful about in calculating the coupling is that uh, when Dale Tronrud assigned the eighth pigment, he assigned it mm. to one monomer, but it's actually coupled to the other monomer. So you have to. So if you look at just a monomer and you put the eighth pigment in there, it, the coupling looks extremely weak. Yeah, it's way off but it's the actually the it's one. actually stronger, yeah. but it's going to the to the next monomer over, and so it's it, that's just a that's just a nomenclature thing. But yeah, right, and and it, yeah, it's sandwiched between two subunits, so you don't really know well which one does it belong to. But in reality, it's it's more strongly coupled to the subunit that is not the one that it is assigned to in the right, right. That's unfortunate. But that's just a kind of a, yeah, an unfortunate uh, choice. Not doesn't really, I think, fundamental, but it's, it's something that you have to kind of keep track of. Maybe we should stop now and thank Greg again for a really exciting talk. Thank you very much.